Let's look at John chapter 16. We'll begin at verse 16 of John 16, and we'll look at verses 16 through 18. I'll give you an introduction, and we'll move into our study. John chapter 16, beginning at verse 16, reading to verse 18. Jesus said, a little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. And then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's saying. Now, Jesus is returning to a theme that he's been teaching his men for a good portion of his ministry. He says here in verse 16, a little while. Well, he says in a little while, that would be another way of saying, I have a few hours to live. So in a little while, I have a few few hours, you will not see me. In other words, I'm going to be buried. So a little while, I I have a few hours to live. You will not see me, I will be buried. And yet again, a little while, you will see me. Because I go to the Father. In other words, three days later, I will be resurrected. That's what he's saying here. In a little while, I have a few hours to live. You will not see me. I'll be buried. And yet again, a little while, you will see me because I go to the Father. Because three days later, I'll be resurrected. We know that because those are the events that follow the teachings that he gives. And so... When you think about this, we need to remember that in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had been preparing his men for some time for this. Uh, I'll remind you in my introduction of a few things so that I might provide a foundation for our teaching. All you need to do is remember that from the beginning until the end, Jesus had had made references to his death and resurrection all the way in the beginning of his ministry in John's Gospel, chapter 2 verses 19 through 21, all the way into the second chapter, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was speaking and teaching concerning that. And Jesus, will see in John 2, 19 through 21, answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days. And then John tells us he was speaking of the temple of his body. So from the beginning of his ministry, He was speaking concerning the fact that he was going to be buried and yet resurrected. Later on in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 17, he said this. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. When you look at Matthew's Gospel in chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, it says, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And he said, the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. So Jesus has been telling them from the beginning in the middle to the end of his ministry that he was going to die. He clearly taught them that his death was necessary in order that they might obtain salvation. When we saw in John chapter 12, verse 24, he made it clear, unless a grain of wheat fall into the the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, he said, it will bring forth much fruit. So he'd already been speaking concerning his death and and the power of the death and and, and, and how that was necessary to die to obtain salvation. Paul tells us uh, those things a variety of times in his writings. He lets us know that it's something that was necessary. Jesus' death was necessary. When he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, Paul said, I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. When he was writing to the Thessalonians in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10 of of 1 Thessalonians, he said, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. And so from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus had been speaking concerning the fact that he was going to die, that he would be buried, but that he would also be resurrected. And so he gave explanation concerning why he would do this. The explanation is simple. It's that people might receive forgiveness, that they might receive eternal life, and that they might go to heaven. That's why he did it. That's why he died. That's why he laid his life down. In John 3, 
In verses 14 and 15, he'd said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus, from the beginning, was laying that out for the people. If you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You have to believe on the one whom the Lord has sent. He's going to lay his life down in order that he might atone for your sins. It's found over and over and over again. And that's how God draws us to himself. In John 12, 32, he said, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. It was the death of Christ on the cross that draws people to salvation. They've been prepared. We've been going through John's gospel. And we've seen that they were thoroughly prepared. But the teachings that Jesus was giving was very disturbing and even confusing to them. They've been especially disturbed by his insistence that he was about to leave them. That was something that they just had a very difficult time with. Remember in chapter 13, remember how in verse 33, he had said, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, you will seek me. But where I'm going, you cannot come. In chapter 14, in verse 28, you've heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. He had said in chapter 16, verse 6, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And so Jesus has been preparing them. He's going to depart. They're going to take him and violently put him to death. They're going to bury him. But three days later, he will be raised from the dead. He made it very clear that was about to take place. But all of this has caused confusion. And so as he's been sharing these things, uh, it, they are now very confused amongst themselves. And it says that in verse 17, some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while, you'll not see me. And again, a little while, you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. We don't understand it. Once again, they don't understand and that's why Jesus exhorted them to listen closely to what he would teach them. You know, that's a good habit, by the way, is to listen closely to what the Word of God says. Listen closely, weigh the words thoroughly, because Jesus commands us to do that. If you take notes, Luke chapter 9, verses 44 and 45, listen to what Jesus said. Let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. They didn't understand this saying. It was hidden from them so that they could not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Well, you're seeing something similar here. What is he talking about? They're saying amongst themselves. They're not addressing him. Notice that. They're speaking amongst themselves. And as they speak amongst themselves, they don't understand. And that's why it says in verse 18, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Verse 19, now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves what, uh, about what I said a little while, and you'll not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? So Jesus addresses them. Now Jesus made the statement in order to once again teach them of what was about to come. He had anticipated their their response when he had made that statement and he answers their question even though it's not being directed to him and it's one of the things by the way that a teacher does a teacher can anticipate people's questions by the way that they teach the things that they teach uh, my staff can tell you that when i'm ministering to my staff um, concerning leadership principles and things of that nature that very often I will say something to them that is intended to provoke a question. It's intended to. I want them to ask. I want them to say, what do you mean by that? I want that. Because in the question, I can see whether or not they're understanding what I'm trying to say. 
and then by the question, I can supply the answer to what they are hearing and wanting to know. And that's a teacher's technique. Jesus did that quite often. Jesus often would use illustrations. He would often use stories, very often use what are called parables, which was intended to cause people to actually think through what he was saying so that they might come to the point that he was making. And there were things that Jesus would say to his disciples. We just saw an example of that when he said something that really was to them very kind of, very confusing, a little while this and a little while that. But instead of coming to speak to him, what did they do? They took it to themselves and they asked amongst themselves, what is this that he's saying? Now, Jesus knows they're doing that. He expects that they are. And that's why he begins to supply the answer for them. That's why he begins to address them. He anticipates their response when he makes that statement. And he answers the question, even though it's not being directed to him. And so in verse 20, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. You will weep and lament. There's going to be an open, visible expression of sorrow and grief. The death of Jesus Christ caused those who loved him, and you can imagine, terrible pain. Terrible pain. I think that... I think that sometimes... Because we're familiar with the gospel story, guys, we almost take his death for granted because isn't that why he came? We know enough scripture that tells us God loved the world, he gave his son, isn't that why he came? He prepared his disciples, we see it by going through the gospels, and isn't that why he came? And sometimes we might have a, an attitude that is actually shallow in terms of how we ought to be responding to those kinds of things that Jesus taught. I remember on one occasion as a young Christian, I was dis disillusioned and I went to speak to an older Christian whom I loved very much. He was one of my professors at the Bible college I went to and, and I was speaking to him Actually, this was a pastor that I went to, not my Bible college professor, a pastor. And I was speaking to him, and I told him I was disillusioned with the Lord. And I'll never forget how he looked at me, and he said, you know, he said, you're disappointed and you're disillusioned? I said, yes, I am. He says, you need to understand how much God loves you, David. He said, God loves you so much. And this is what he said, basically. I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he said. He said, God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross. He said, Jesus died for you. And he said it with passion. He said it with, and I looked at him and I said, of course he did. That's his job. Of course he did. That's his job. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever, have you ever minimized the death of Christ in your own mind to think, well, yeah, yeah, he did. I've done that. Sure, he died on the cross. That's his job. He came to die. That's what the Bible said. God loved the world, gave his son. That's his job. I'll never forget my pastor friend's face when I told him that. It was like shocked when I said that to him. Like, how could you say something so callous, so unfeeling? And he was right in feeling that. But do you know there are a lot of Christians who think that? Yeah, yeah, he died. Yeah, I know, I, he died. Okay, he died. But you have to put yourself back for just a moment, 2,000 years. You have to put yourself back to the event that's taking place here. Take yourself in your own mind for a moment and, and say you were part of the group of men who were there that night when Jesus was betrayed by Judas and Judas had left to go and finish his betrayal and Jesus had remained there with the men and began to share even more deep things concerning the power of the Spirit and his return and all of these wonderful doctrines he began to pour in in his last, last night with the men, sharing with them things that they needed to know. 
And, and as he's speaking concerning this, the more and more it becomes apparent that something's about to take place that is, that, is, that is deep and very disturbing. When he's speaking of these things, their hearts begin to be agonizing within themselves. They begin to agonize within themselves, and their hearts begin to, to palpitate, and they're thinking, wait a minute, what is, he ta- what is this he means in a little What is he talking about? We don't understand, and, and that's what's taking place here. We don't know what he's saying. And he says, you're inquiring among yourselves what I said a little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. Most assuredly I say to you that you will reap and weep and lament. The world will rejoice, but you will be sorrowful. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. The weep and lament. In Luke 23, verse 27, the Bible says when Jesus was, was carrying his cross... A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. As Jesus was there carrying the cross through that city street, there were women lining the street, the women of Jerusalem's daughter, women of Jerusalem, daughters of Jerusalem, and they saw him as he was carrying this cross and the weeping and the lamenting, the pouring out of pain as they saw that. And as this is taking place, on the other hand, his enemies, the world, would rejoice in, in the Psalms, in Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, it says, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And so that was the attitude of those who loved him. There was a pour, the pouring out of pain. There was the weeping. There's the lamenting. There's the sorrow. There's the grief. That what's taking place? And you can't imagine what it would have been like. You can't imagine what it would have felt like to see this taking place. To see the one that you loved. To see the one that you admired. To see the one who never lost an argument. To see the one who could, who could, who could heal any sick condition. To see the lepers who had been cleansed. To see the blind who at one time had their eyes open and now they could see. To see people raised from the dead. To see you know, when the Apostle Peter walked on water and things like that. Can you imagine how many things they saw? They come across the lake and they land in a place called the Gadarenes and these demon-possessed men come running out and, and they're screaming and, 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 and wailing and it's dark and scary and, and the disciples are going, oh my God, what are we going to do? And Jesus cast the demons out. I mean, there was nothing, <laughs> nothing that Jesus couldn't do. No argument that he couldn't win. From the time he was 12 years old, he was winning arguments. He never lost an argument. Do you ever think that you have a question he can't answer? You know, Jesus, you know, I just want to ask you a question now. I don't want to put you on the spot, but there's not a question he can't answer. It's not a thing he cannot do within his will that is consistent with who he is. These men, put yourself in their place for just a minute, had seen things no other man or woman had ever been able to see. They heard words that prophets died wishing they could have heard. They were even empowered to do works themselves to cleanse lepers, to heal the sick. They did things because Jesus gave them a portion of of the Spirit in their ministry to do works. And now this person that they loved, this person that they worshipped, this person that when they were with him, they were secure. Safe. There's hardly anything that is as valuable as when you're with people you feel safe with. It's a fact. A husband ought to be the kind of man that makes his wife feel safe. And a woman should be the kind of woman that a man, can, his heart can safely trust in her. And your children ought to feel safe when you're around, not afraid, but safe 
because you're in the house. I don't think my daughter would mind me saying this. My daughter, Corinne, went through a very sad divorce many years ago now. I don't stand up and tell my children's pain to people, but I don't think she'd have a problem with me saying this. I pray that she doesn't. It's her testimony, not mine. But I want to illustrate it in a way. Because at one time, her, her then husband wasn't home she would be by herself with babies. She was taking care of them. And I told her, you need to come and live with us. I took her back into my house and took my gran grandchildren back into my home. And Marie and I cared for our babies because I had a little boy, my Josiah, who had said, and I don't remember, he may have been four or five at the time. I don't remember the age. He was little. But he had said, now I'm the man of the house. A little boy shouldn't feel that, should he? A little boy shouldn't feel that. Now I'm the man of the house. No. So I told Marie, I said, I'm going to bring him to my home and take care of my kids because I love them. And one day I had my little guy in his little room sitting down in my house, but gave him a room. And I sat with him on the bed, and I looked at him, so I, I said, when you're home and your daddy's not there, are you afraid? Because I knew he was, because he's now the man of the house. And he said, yes, I've been afraid, Papa. And I looked at him, and I said, you're now in my home. I said, and Jesus is with us here. He's with us here. And he'll be with you, baby. And I said, and Papa's here too. And I'll be here for you. Safe. We need that sense of security and safety. We need it. We need it. And when Jesus was, Jesus was around, there was safety and there was security. Who could defeat Jesus? Who could defeat Jesus? You could almost have a pride about hanging around with the heavyweight champion of the universe. You could feel that. The demons would, would flee. The enemies would be silenced and diseases would be taken care of. But now, this superhero is saying, I'm going to leave you. What is this he's talking about? They're saying amongst themselves. What does he mean by this? You're not going to see me. Then you're going to see me. And that confusion and that grief, and that's why Jesus addresses it. Again, he said, you will weep and lament. Yes, they did. When Jesus was placed on that on that cross, when his body was taken lifeless from the cross, was placed in a tomb, they wept, they sorrowed, they grieved. But what did the world do? The world, the world rejoiced. I mean, when Jesus was on the cross, it's recorded how that in, in Mark 15, 29 through 31, those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said he saved others, himself he cannot save. That's what they did. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. His disciples were broken his mother's there at the, at the cross, someplace close enough to see him with John and others. And she's watching what they're doing to her son. She didn't smile. She didn't laugh. She didn't mock. She was mother. She wept. She was broken. And that's what Jesus is referring to. He's speaking concerning what is going to take place and the pain and everything that's involved in this. But he goes on to say in verse 21, a woman, when she 
And she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. You know, there was a Jewish prayer, thank God that I'm not a Gentile nor a woman. Listen, if it was up to us men, there would be no overpopulation. No. Nope. You have one kid, that's enough. And I was, I was amazed. I was amazed that, that my wife was willing to do that four times. Four times. Once is enough. You know, and I went through it with her. You know, I felt her pain. No, I went through it with her. I had my own kind of pain. I'm still going on called kids you know when when I've said this before but I my mind races back to that when she was giving birth to Corinne and we had gone through what they call Lamaze classes I don't even know if they have those anymore perhaps they do I don't know where you have to learn the different breathing how many of you went through Lamaze just so I know so you remember ha ha he he hoo hoo remember that <laughs> yeah ha ha he he hoo hoo and, and you know, and it cost at that time it cost like twenty dollars or something to go through it. And I spent my money, and I became a black belt <laughs> in Lamaze. And I was ready. And so I, I I knew about watching that little monitor, and I knew about the breathing and all that they taught. I still remember as we were there, and I was sitting in a chair. And Marie was on her side, and she went through labor 33 hours. And so she's laying on her side, and, and I'm just like, yeah, you know, it's time to put my training in, you know, go for it. And, and I still, her face is about eight inches from mine, and I was there close to her. She's looking at me, and, she's, and I'm watching that monitor, monitor going up, and I said, okay, honey, it's time to hee hee. That's, that's as much as I got to say. That was it. That was it. She gritted her teeth. My little angel, my precious, my blessing from God, my virtuous woman, and everything else. She grits her teeth. Shut up. <laughs> Sit down and be quiet. And I'm sitting there, man, I blew 20 bucks for this. And, and I watched the drama of that and, 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 and the pain. And the nurse approaches and says, Mr. Rosales, your, uh, your wife is going through a, an awful lot of pain right now. She just won't admit it. She won't admit it. Marie will not admit it to this day. She just, she'll not admit it. But we're monitoring her body, and her body is in a lot of pain. I'm asking for permission to give her something to relieve the pain because my wife wouldn't admit the pain she was going through. And so I said, of course, hit her up. Give her a double dose. Give me some too. <laughs> yeah. Give me a to-go order. I'll do it at home for myself. You know. And you know the funny thing about all of that is she wanted another one. And then she wanted another one. And then she wanted another one. We had five pregnancies in six years. We lost one of ours in a miscarriage. We had five pregnancies in six years. One after another, after another, after another. And Marie, finally with Anna, our last, in between her hee hee, ha ha, hoo hoo, she said, this is it. This is the last one. And she was her beautiful self once again. And I said, it's done. It's done. And that was our last one. But as I read this, that Jesus says it. Verse 21 again. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow. Her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. And so that's what takes place. 
You see, their depth of sorrow is contrasted with the depth of joy that results. Their heart will be filled with grief, but their sorrow will be turned to joy. You're going to weep at my crucifixion. You will weep at my death. But like a mother's first look at her newborn baby, your sorrow will turn to joy. And those of us fathers who were there in the room when the babies were born, I'm supposing some of you were. There's just something about that, isn't it? When, they, when the baby parts the womb, and then you look at it, and you say, this is ugly. <laughs> I, and I, I, <laughs> one of my kids, one of my kids, I will not tell you the name of the child, <laughs> but their head looked like, a, like an, it was oblong. It was like, it looked like a space, an alien child. And I looked at the doctor and I said, I mean, it'll be good for darts, but <laughs> I looked at him. I said, and he says, don't worry about it. He said, it, it's going to, it'll round. Well, I was really nervous. I said, oh my goodness, what an ugly little dart head this one is. And you have those babies and you raise them and there's the joy that you have. A human being has been born into the world and then you... They hand you the baby, they, they, they wrap it up, and after cleaning it up and dropping those drops in their eyes, I'm supposing they continue to do that to this day, and then they put it in this little blanket, and then they bring the baby to me. They brought the baby first to me, and they hand this baby into you, your hands, and you, you're looking, and you're just, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing. It really is to look, and my goodness. My goodness. And then I w walked the baby over and, and I placed the baby in my wife's arms. She holds on to her child. And there's that, that moment that you're capturing your heart for the rest of your life. There's that joy that a human being has been born into the world. And it is a joy and it's an exciting thing. And so Jesus is making that very clear. And he's saying it's, it's something that that's going to cause joy, even though now you have sorrow. Notice verse 22. He says, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will re rejoice. His resurrection will produce a joy that far surpasses their grief. The certain knowledge of his resurrection will produce a sense of joy that's a continuing sense of joy. Psalm 30 verse 5 says it like this. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So his resurrection produces a joy that will far surpass a temporary sorrow. He says in verse 23, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. You were just wrestling with what I've been teaching. Your questions will be resolved. My resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit will answer any questions that you may have. And the Spirit will fully reveal when at first you did not understand. You now know in part, but then you will know completely. That reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9 through 12, when, when Paul said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You don't understand completely, but you will. And then he said, again, he said, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, Earlier in chapter 14, in verse 13, he had taught them that prayer in his name would bring glory to the Father.
But here, he's teaching that prayer through him produces joy. This kind of prayer is a, a change. It's a new state of affairs between Jesus and his disciples. You see, until now, they had spoken directly to him or had addressed their prayers to the Father. So they would speak to him, but they prayed to the Father. But now, they are going to learn to come to the Father through him. And in, in asking in his name, they're realizing that he's the mediator, the intermediary with the Father. And you're going to be praying, again, notice in verse 24, he said, in my name. In my name is another way of speaking of in my authority. You see, Jesus is about to leave them, and they must relate to God through all that he has shown them. And in coming to the Father through Jesus, the doors of heaven will be open to their prayer. And the result is going to be joy, a joy that overflows your life. And Jesus had given them insight concerning the way to joy. He had said in chapter 15, verse 11, that joy is the result of remaining in his word. He had said, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. But here he's saying your joy will come through prayer. So obviously, the word of God and prayer results in joy. And their joy is made full in this way and no other. One of the things, and I'm going to close with the thought. One of the things that the church needs to become more aware of is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. We have a tendency, I think, of doing everything, and then when nothing happens that we want, then we pray. That's the opposite of how it ought to be. How it ought to be is take everything to the Father in prayer first and foremost. And, and sometimes you might find this interesting, but you'll agree with me because I know you've experienced this to be true. This is biblically solid what I'm sharing. It's, it's, when you pray, then that's when the Lord by his spirit very often leads you to do the things that you didn't know what to do before. And now you know, and you take a step in faith, and then you see God move, and then you say, so that's what I had to die to myself and rely on you first and foremost so that I could see what you wanted to give to me all along that I wasn't ready to receive. And a long time ago, I began to learn that lesson. I continue to learn that lesson, by the way. I haven't learned it completely. But take things to the Lord in prayer, first and foremost. First and foremost. And, and learn to pray without ceasing the way Paul shares with us that we're to pray without ceasing. In other words, our, our lives are, are to be a habit of prayer, a, a, a constant prayer. And, and I think sometimes, especially when we're new in our faith, we think that prayer can only be made in a certain place or a certain posture. And so I will, I will go to a church and I will get on my knees and I will pray. Or when I go to bed at night, I will get on my knees by... The, and, and we get into the posture, but I discovered a long time ago that that prayer is a posture of the heart. It's an attitude of the mind and the will. And so you're driving and you're praying. Hopefully you're keeping your eyes open while you're doing that. But you're praying, you know. Lord, that guy went through a red light. In Jesus' name, please bring a cop. You know, you're praying constantly. <laughs> And have you discovered that in your prayer life that, yes, there are times there are formal prayers. Yes, there are times when we gather in groups and people and we pray with one another and all of that, and, and that's a good thing. But I've discovered that, that prayer is instant. Prayer, prayer is something that's a habit of the life. It's, it's, it's not just restricted to me coming up, opening the Bible, opening with prayer, closing with prayer, but it's a habit of life. It's, it's putting your head on your pillow at night just before you go to sleep. 
and is saying, Lord, thank you for the day. It's waking up in the morning and looking around, and, and you're not quite awake yet, but your first thing you're doing is you're saying, God, help me today, and you're speaking to him. It's a constant conversation. Sometimes you're praying for somebody, Lord, I'm concerned with this person. This is what's going on. I'll be seeing him today. I need wisdom because I don't know how to help. Sometimes I'll be speaking to somebody who's got a problem, and, and as I'm looking at them and they see me looking at them, what in reality I'm actually doing is saying, I'm saying, God, in Jesus' name, give me wisdom. Give me scripture. Give me, give me something that can help this person who has a need. You're praying constantly. That's where your heart is. It's conversation. I've, and I'll make it in a human kind of, uh, you know, something everybody knows in, in, in one way or another. I've been asked many times, how is it that you're, you and your wife have, have a good, and we do, how, how is it that your wife and you have such a good marriage? I can tell you, from the very first date that we ever had, the very first date before she was even my girlfriend, she was my first date with her. We, I picked her up at 11 o'clock, and I went home after a date, 11 in the morning. We spent the whole day, and, and I went and dropped her off at her place and, and sat around with her. She had some roommates. You know, we were chaperoned. She had some roommates. And I went home at 1 o'clock, 13 hours in our first date. And for almost all of those hours, we were talking. That's how we began our dating relationship. My wife and I, to this day, every day, talk, talk, talk with one another. Every day, constantly. It is a constant conversation. Constantly. Because I made up my mind, I want to know her. And she made up her mind, she's worth knowing, I guess. <laughs> so we had a conversation that is ongoing. A conversation that at night never really ends. Because all we do is close our eyes and the next morning we pick up the conversation. That's how I have a good marriage. Conversation. I know her. I want to know about her. I want to know what she likes. I want to know what she doesn't like. I want to know her. What are her dreams? What are her plans? What are her wishes? What does she need from me? That's marriage. I've been that way with the Lord. What am I to do? What would you have me to do? This book in front of me tells me. So we talk. Prayer is me speaking to him. Reading his word is him speaking back to me. It's a conversation. And up to this time, you've asked, you haven't asked anything in my name. Ask that you may receive, that your joy may be full. Up to this point, you haven't understood the authority that you have through me. But you need to know Jesus is teaching them. There's only one way to God, and that's through the Son. So go through me. I am the one that mediates between you and my Father. And now you ask in my name. All that I've taught you up to this point is coming to this. Ask God whatever pleases him. Ask him through me. Because that's why I came, so you might have a relationship with him.